Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the fifth webinar in the group of 78 six session series of webinars on the future of UN peacekeeping in the transition to a more peaceful world. Why UN peace operations are critical and need to be expanded. My name is Jane Bolden. I'm a professor at the Royal Military College of Canada and cross appointed to Queen's University. For me, this is old home week. <laughs> Everybody who's on the panel goes way back with me. So when Peggy asked me to chair this, it was, uh, um, it was a real pleasure. Um, I think I've known everybody on the panel for longer than any of us would like to admit to. Um, so welcome everyone. I think there will be a few people joining as we in the next few minutes, but uh, we're going to get going. On 24th of September, we had our keynote launch with former head of UN peacekeeping Jean-Marie Gehenot, who noted that in spite of growing Security Council fragmentation, and even paralysis, UN peacekeeping mandates are being renewed and more European countries beginning to re-engage in them. On 26 September, panel one looked at successes and failures and lessons learned. And Professor Lees Howard reviewed the robust statistical evidence that UN peacekeeping works far more often than it fails. Richard Gowan highlighted the challenge posed to UN missions like those in the DRC and Sudan by the sidelining of UN conflict resolution roles by regional actors with their own agendas. That too harkened back to an admonition by Ambassador Gayano about the primacy of politics, that is of finding political solutions to the fundamentally political problems underlining these conflicts and the consequent need for UN peace operations to reestablish their preeminent role in facilitating conflict resolution by the parties. On 28th September, panel two, entitled Controversies, Impartiality, Consent, Use of Force, examined what UN peacekeeping operations should or should not do, particularly in relation to the use of force, as well as assessing UN peacekeeping partnerships in Africa. Professor Jane Bolden, that's me, focused on the tension between the core UN peacekeeping principles of consent of the parties, impartiality, and limited use of force on the one hand, and stabilization mandates requiring robust use of force on the side of the government, of the host nation, on the other. Professor Paul Williams highlighted the chaotic array of partnerships the UN is facing in Africa with hybrid UN African Union missions and various other lesser types of support and pressures for financial assistance. Our panel three on the future of UN peace operations took place on the 3rd of October. Victoria Holt, Tory Holt, emphasized the resilience and adaptability of UN peacekeeping, but cautioned that it was not and could not be a counterinsurgency or warfighting force. She highlighted a recent study on the political practice of peacekeeping on evidence-based strategies to enhance the vital UN role of facilitating political solutions to the conflict. Peter Langeel outlined the potential for a United Nations Emergency Peace Service to replace untimely delays and insufficient resources with a cost-effective means for prompt startup of demanding UN peace operations. He also underscored the preventive and deterrent potential of UN emergency peace service operations. All of these sessions are now available for viewing on the YouTube G and G78 website. And Sarah Bowles, the G78 Executive Secretary, is sharing the link with you now or shortly on chat. This brings us to this evening's panel four, contributions by Canada to UN peace operations. Here we ask the question, what might Canada do in terms of advocacy, funding, institution building, training, and technology to strengthen UN peace operations and contribute to a global shift towards sustainable peace and common security? Following presentations by each of our three panelists, whom I will introduce shortly, we will take up the questions that participants, you, can pose by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can do this while the presentations are being delivered, as well as during the question time itself. You can also click the like button for questions other than your own, and this will move them up the list. A question that has been answered should then show as such on the list 
And I thank the G78 Executive Secretary, Sarah Bowles, in advance for looking after that function for me. Especially, thank you for me for that. Note that we will have a pause for a week or so to allow the planning committee to review all of these sessions um, as preparation for providing for the final session on conclusions and recommendations. Now for the introductions. Walter Dorn. Walter Dorn is one of Canada's most well-known champions of UN peacekeeping and a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces College. He specializes in arms control, peace operations, just war theory, international criminal law, international verification and enforcement, and the United Nations. As an operational professor, he has been a UN electoral officer for the 1999 referendum in East Timor and a visiting professional with the International Criminal Court in 2010. He also served as a consultant with the UN's Department of Peacekeeping Operations, including on the expert panel on technology and innovation in UN peacekeeping. Currently, during a sabbatical, Dr. Dorn is working with the UN as a technology innovation expert, exploring technologies for testing, piloting, and employing in UN peace operations. The author of many books and articles, in 2016, Dorn was the lead author in a study published by the Rideau Institute entitled Unprepared for Peace, The Decline of Canadian Peacekeeping Training and What to Do About It, a study which was updated for the International Journal in 2018. Stephen Barani. Stephen Barani is a full professor with the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. He works at the Nexus of Development and Security on peace building, on the challenges of security system reform, development cooperation, gender equality, and persons with disability in fragile and conflict affected states, especially in Haiti. He also focuses on Canada's international policies in fragile and conflict, effect, uh, conflict affected states. Prior to joining the university in 2008, he worked as a practitioner with various governmental, non-governmental and research institutions in Canada, Central America, the Caribbean and Europe. He has published widely on issues related to peace, keep, peace building and development in fragile and conflict affected states, as well as on Canadian policy in this domain. Finally, last but not least, everybody knows Peggy Mason. Peggy Mason is the president of the Rideau Institute, an independent policy research and advocacy think tank focused on helping revitalize Canada's peacekeeping, diplomatic, peacemaking, and peacebuilding roles in the world through creative, innovative, all right, and inclusive multilateralism, strengthening the UN capacity for conflict prevention and peaceful conflict resolution and the progressive enhancement of international law. After serving as Canada's ambassador for disarmament to the UN from 1989 to 1995, Mason specialized in helping strengthen UN peacekeeping operations. An external faculty member of the Pearson Peacekeeping Center from 1995 to 2012, she was a directing staff on the first ever UN Integrated Mission Staff Officer course. I won't do the acronym. <laughs> contributed to the first two phases of the Challenges Forum for Peace Operations and engaged as an exercise developer and trainer in over 20 UN, NATO and EU peacekeeping and stabilization exercises. In all of these undertakings, her primary goal was to bring a better understanding of the UN political and diplomatic role to senior commanders and their staff. Okay, that's our introductions. We will go in the order of uh, speakers in which I introduced everyone. Um, so as I indicated in my remarks, as people are talking, feel free to put questions in the Q&A as they occur to you or wait until the end. Each speaker will speak for 15 minutes, roughly. Because we have three speakers, the session will last approximately 90 minutes. Okay, let's get started with Walter Dorn. Walter. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the past because I think the past is prelude, not because uh, I'm old, as you, as you mentioned in the introduction. I, uh, I think that it's important to learn where Canada was in order to see where Canada can go. We have to know where we're at now, what we've done in the past, 
and then explore the many options that we have for the future. Um, and I think there is much to learn from the past. Um, now, I'm a scientist by training, so I like numbers. I'm a number cruncher. And uh, there may be some fatigue with number crunching these days in the age of COVID. Uh, but I think the numbers can give us evidence. And evidence-based statements are probably the most important that can be made uh, when we're looking at uh, where Canada stands now, what the promises have been, and uh, what we could possibly do in the future. So let me transfer into my PowerPoint presentation to be able to give you some of those numbers and some of the history. So Canada does have a very proud peacekeeping tradition. Uh, as we know, Lester Pearson won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1957 for having proposed the first peacekeeping force in 1956 to solve the Suez Crisis. In 1988, when the Nobel Peace Prize was given to UN peacekeepers, Canadians had the most in number of having contributed to peacekeeping, about 80,000 of the 800,000 at the time of the award of the prize. In 92, uh, we put forward the monument uh, reconciliation in Ottawa, one of the prominent monuments in Ottawa, showing three peacekeepers um, keeping watch and standing guard uh, near the National Art Gallery. 94, the Pearson Peacekeeping Center was created and the military created the Peace Support Training Center in 96. In fact, the Reconciliation Monument made the back of the loony. If you're ever fortunate enough to pick up a loony from 1995, you'll see the peacekeepers there. And in 2000, the forces introduced the Peacekeeping Service Medal, uh, PKSM, uh, which is worn by many of the uh, troops and, and officers who have served in peacekeeping up until that time and since, actually. In the 2001 $10 bill, a peacekeeper a woman in a blue beret made the back of the $10 bill uh, underneath a banner that said, Au service la paix, in the service of peace. And indeed, our tradition uh, is exemplified by Canadians who served in the field, including Lou McKenzie, who uh, authored a book called Peacekeeper, although he doesn't identify himself as a peacekeeper anymore. Um, but he, he contributed in a major way to uh, world history with his opening of Sarajevo to international aid in 1993-1992. Romeo Dallaire, of course, served as the force commander in Rwanda, and uh, there have been films uh, both about him and about and uh, of him, uh, including the Shake Hands of the uh, Devil documentary and film on his life uh, in Rwanda and how he managed to save 20 to 30 thousand people during that difficult time. Now, when I do go to my college, I walk past the uh, monument, to the um, list of those who had died in the service of peacekeeping. And at the time it was put up in 1999, uh, Canada had the most number of fatalities, 115 in UN peacekeeping of any nation in the world. It's, um, it shows the commitment of the country that we gave the uh, blood of those who offered their lives and duty to UN peacekeeping missions. We had in the 1990s nine uh, commanders and, and chiefs of UN operations. Um, they served very great distinction and it was a great matter of pride to see these members of the Canadian Armed Forces leading the international community in operations in some of the world's hotspots, Cyprus, uh, Central America coming out of Central uh, War, uh, Unimir uh, with two force commanders, Eastern Zaire, two commanders in Haiti, and uh, one commander on the Golan Heights, which is now a very fractious part of the world. Now, in those missions, we we encountered very difficult situations, including our own embarrassment in Somalia, with uh, uh, several Canadian soldiers having tortured a Somali youth, um, and uh, that actually brought about the, the uh, disbandment of the Airborne Regiment um, after the findings of the the uh, Somalia inquiry called Dishonored Legacy. I mentioned General Dallaire already in Rwanda and the 800,000 who lost their lives when peacekeeping couldn't adapt quick enough to changing circumstances before April of 1994 and indeed in the first few days. And General Dallaire felt that if he had had some 4,000 peacekeepers, he could actually have stopped the genocide in his tracks. And then in Bosnia, the very difficult circumstances of uh, being in a current conflict where the, um, where the sides were actually using peacekeepers, including my 
friend here, Patrick Reckner, uh, Captain Patrick Reckner, as, as human shields against NATO bombing. But eventually, the force was used, the UN became more robust, and so did NATO, and the uh, parties all came to negotiations and debate and peace accords of December 95. And we saw robust NATO operations after that in a time when there was a robust peace accord. But for many uh, Canadians and indeed soldiers around the world, there was a moment of uh, tremendous frustration um, that uh, the UN peacekeeping forces with all the international authority that they had, which just rolled over in their, while they were trying to do their peacekeeping tasks. And there was a sense that the UN needed to become more robust. And those lessons were learned in part um, when the UN uh, took over peacekeeping again, and this chart you'll see the number of peacekeepers deployed, that's uniform peacekeepers, uh, deployed by the UN, starting the typical Cold War average of 10,000 and going to almost 80,000 during the early um, 1990s. And then uh, there was a time of um, where the UN wasn't called upon much, but then in the new century, after year 2000, there'd be, there was a surge in number of peacekeepers till we went over 100,000 deployed personnel in the field, making the UN largest deployer of forces on operations in the world, more than the US government after the withdrawal from, Afgh uh, from Iraq and most of the forces withdrawn from Afghanistan. As you say- oh, that, Sorry, Walter, I'm just gonna interrupt. So can you advance your own slides or? Yep, oh, sorry, you're not seeing this slides, okay. Yeah, sorry, we were- I, I thought we might have- advanced on one side. Um, Perfect, just if you can, that's great. Thank you. Well, so, I've, uh, I've got two screens here. Apparently, one screen is um, not an answer. Let me do it this way. Um, or there's maybe, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, uniform personnel, I've shown the figures. I'm going over 100,000. And uh, the UN becoming more robust as symbolized by the attack helicopters, although certainly not as robust as was, is necessary for the field missions and the difficult circumstances of the field. Now, if you ask Canadians, they would tell you that the, um, one of the greatest contributions of Canada to the world uh, is peacekeeping. Um, multiculturalism and accepting immigrants is, is slightly more now and when the, when the poll was redone in 2018 rather than 2008. But you can, you can see that it still is a, considered a substantial contribution to the world. And indeed, we, uh, we tried to uh, up our numbers. Uh, we had gone down. Um, at the in 1990s to just um, a few hundred peacekeepers. And we, we pledged to the international community at the ministerial meeting in uh, 2016 that we would go to 600 troops um, in peacekeeping um, as a maximum of 150 police. And we pledged uh, 450 million for a stabilization program, a peace ops program. Now here's an overview of the contributions over time and what we find is that the, uh, the Cold War average was around 1,000 personnel deployed for 40 years, now, sometimes going into 3,300 at our peak. But after the, uh, that period of 1995, numbers went down with some missions coming up in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Haiti uh, during transition period. Um, but we'd never come anywhere near the numbers that we were in, in peacekeeping uh, during the Cold War, and nowhere near the 500. Um, or 600, in fact, that had been promised in the field. And in the Vancouver ministerial, which followed that earlier, uh, one year after the London ministerial, we promised to uh, up to specific pledges. In fact, Canada pledged an LC initiative. Uh, the pledges advanced on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, up to 600 military personnel, including an aviation task force, a quick reaction force, new police missions, and tactical airlift and innovative training were all things that we championed while we hosted the world in Vancouver on the subject of peacekeeping. We did do a mission for one year um, in Bali, which was a substantial contribution, but as you can see, it's less than half of the number pledged in the uh, Vancouver pledge, uh, it was 250 CAF members with some very substantial equipment, including Chinook helicopters and escorts and Griffin helicopters. So if you actually look at the numbers, I show here from 2005, the Martin government was providing somewhere over 300 peacekeepers um, when Harper took over. With the withdrawal in the UNDOC mission, the uh, numbers of total numbers of police and military 
came to somewhere between uh, 150 to 200 during Harper government, averaging um, more than 100 peacekeepers um, during the tenure. Now, Trudeau came in saying that he would renew Canada's commitment to peacekeeping after Harper had let it fall. But in, in fact, the, the numbers are substantially less than the average number for the Harper government. So that promise has not been kept. In fact, Canada has ranked from number one down to uh, currently number 77 is shown by this graph showing since the end of the Cold War, um, we had this uh, precipitous uh, decline in uh, rank among peacekeepers. If we look today, we have four military in Mali, seven police, and that's the only place, place where we currently have police serving under the UN flag. And then Congo, Cyprus, uh, South Sudan, and so making a total of only 34 peacekeepers in total as of the end of August, the latest figures. If we look at women, peace and security, and our initiative to try and get more women in the field, we are not doing very well on that either. Only 10 uniformed uh, women, uh, that a country the size of Canada contributing only 10 women is rather shameful, in my opinion, uh, for a country that, that has contributed hundreds in the past. The numbers as percentage, the numbers may be low, but the percentages are higher. Uh, in terms of the percentages deployed from 20 to up to 57 deployed by the categories as indicated. Now, what about the ELSI initiative that Canada made such a deal for uh, of in Vancouver and the subsequent New York ministerial? Uh, we did manage to raise, we put in uh, 13 million of our own Canadian funds. We got a few allies to put in some extra funds, but uh, less than 1 million has been spent in the three years since the announcement. So it's really hard to see how it's actually had made an impact in the field if even the funding to train women is, is less than a million dollars. And indeed, the funding to support the program for the administration is $250,000. So at this point, not a big track record. If we look um, in New York, in uh, the UN Secretariat, we don't find a single Canadian military officer on uh, secondment to the UN uh, deployed um, in the Office of Military Affairs. We have a gratis officer, but no one in OMA. And the Security Council, of course, we lost our bid the second time in a row, partly in part because of our low contribution and, and low profile in peacekeeping despite the government pledges. Now, the General Assembly is the one area where there is some good news with uh, Canada chairing the Peace Building Commission this year and Ambassador Ray taking over uh, in August of this year. And in funding, Canada is the seventh or eighth largest contributor to funding. We pay our dues in full, on time, and without conditions unlike our neighbors in the South. So all that past, what does it tell us about the future? Well, we can do a lot. We can provide so many more uniform personnel. We've done it in the past, and we can do it again in the future. There's no reason why we can't meet that 600 military and 150 police for the UN's missions. We can provide excellent equipment because the UN has been failing uh, to provide, equip its peacekeepers with what's required, given that the majority of peacekeepers are from the developing world. I spent a lot of time advising the UN on specific technologies that could be deployed like infrared and uh, night vision, uh, satellites, and different types of monitors and non-lethal weapons. There's many ideas. We were pioneering in, in, in during the Cold War in, in making peacekeeping work, giving new ideas for doctrine and policies, but uh, just seeing so many other countries overtake us. We could provide experts. Um, I myself was deployed uh, to the UN during a previous sabbatical and I'm currently deployed, um, compliments of peace ops in, in Ottawa. Um, but it was almost a sad commentary on, on Canada's contribution when the foreign minister, Christian Freeland, met with the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping. And um, the Under Secretary General could thank Canada for providing me when I, that, there wasn't more important things to, to say on a list of uh, Canada's provision to the UN Secretariat. So uh, I, I'm, I wish that Canada would provide dozens of experts and really helping the UN. Funds, it is doing pretty well on extra budgetary funding, uh, about $12 million, but uh, the UN needs far more and, and certainly call for political leadership. In the, uh, in the, during the Trump administration, we needed to be real champions of peacekeeping and we weren't there for the UN and that's probably why we didn't get the Security Council seat. So, you know, keep our promises and build back better. Now that we're, uh, now that we're looking at, at building back at, uh, during the COVID era and, and afterwards, well, let's do better in peacekeeping. Let's actually make Canada a 
greater contributor, a better contributor than we were during the Cold War. This world needs peacekeeping and it needs Canada and we should not be missing in action. Peacekeeping is a continuing adventure and there are so many things we could be doing in so many different ways. And um, I'm gonna leave it to my very competent colleagues to be exploring these many ways that we can help make peace in the world. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Walter. Um, now turning to Stephen Barani, who's going to pick up from there and um, um, over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Jane and Walter. And Sarah, would you be kind enough to share my slides, please? Okay, so as we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, they will in due course. Uh, here's a preview. I'm not going to talk much about peacekeeping. You might wonder why, uh, given that uh, the focus of this conference, the series of webinars is on peace building, uh, why I'm actually going to focus, sorry, the conference is on peacekeeping. Let's get it straight. Why am I going to focus on peace building? <clears throat> so, um, Sarah, could you, uh, is there any way that you could move this into just seeing the slide and not, yeah, and then moving to the next slide, please? Okay. Great. So, is there any way to just see the slide you're showing? So just press F5, actually. Or just uh, the little uh, icon at the bottom of the screen to the right, uh, the one with the, the uh, monitor, that should do the trick. Anyways, <clears throat> why am I focusing on peace building? Uh, instead of peacekeeping. Simply put, and as Mr. Gehino and others uh, noted over the past week, though UN peace operations have become much more multi-dimensional uh, since the 1990s, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, the UN and others recognize that peace operations alone obviously cannot consolidate peace. Indeed, in the UN high-level panel report 2015, uh, the advisor group of experts on the UN's peacebuilding architecture, WFPS uh, report that seen the year in the World Bank UN Pathways for Peace report in 2017, and so on. They all recognize that peacebuilding is required to address the root causes of uh, conflicts and of fragility. Uh, through longer-term institutional, economic, and other reforms uh, that are also required to prevent to prevent the resurgence of conflict uh, uh, and to foster inclusive development. So, um, what Mr. Gehino and others and these reports have is what's become, in a sense, an article of faith, uh, particularly since 2015, is that international interventions in these very difficult areas, not only peacekeeping, but in the, era, the broader domain of peace building, must be politically astute and politically inclusive too. Otherwise, they're likely to fail, and it's on the basis of those ideas, that conception of positive peace and Galtung sense, that I will uh, roll out some arguments about Canada's changing approach. Next slide, please. So is there any way we can not have the notes showing in the next slide? That would be great, because those are mine. Anyways, so be it. We'll let it all hang out. So the, as most of you know, uh, in 2015, and as Walter mentioned, uh, the in fact, in the campaign and then in the mandate letters following uh, the Liberals' victory in, in October 2015, the government promised to realign Canada's approach on the UN and on multilateralism more broadly, including by deploying uh, more peacekeepers in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it also promised to put the peace part back into whole-of-government approaches in fragile and conflict-affected states and societies. It also promised to make gender equality a priority in Canada's international engagement. Now, for those who weren't 
uh, paying close attention to politics before 2015, um, uh, it's important to know that that vision was actually quite different from the approach taken under successive Harper governments led by Prime Minister Stephen Harper, which generally favored NATO-led interventions to, uh, com compared to UN peace operations, generally supported stabilization ops in Afghanistan, Haiti, Libya, and was far less sympathetic to things like peace building and gender, e any gender equality, uh, which in fact almost disappeared from the official Canadian lexicon. Uh, from uh, 2006 to 2015. So what happened at the policy level um, after uh, those promises were made in 2015? Next slide, please. So as Walter mentioned in passing, um, uh, in 2016, so in the first year of, of, um, of office, the Liberals actually changed start, which was the Stabilization and Reconstruction Task Force, into the Peace Ops, the <clears throat> Peace and Stabilization Cooperation Program. So this is about imaging, it's about packaging, but it's important for them, and I think we should uh, try to take it seriously, and place the peace right at the forefront of their, their uh, approach, if you will, symbolically. Uh, and uh, peace ops, but peace ops continued to spend about $100 million a year on peace building and other, and other uh, priorities, including conflict prevention and so on. And of course, in 2017, as we know, the government approved the Feminist International Assistance Policy and uh, tabled the Canadian National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. And those pieces of policy, those policy statements, really place gender equality at the core of Canada's approach to many things, uh, but including number six priority under the FIAP, peace building, conflict prevention, and security. And then of course, as Walter noted, government launched the LC initiative and so on. <clears throat> so it's partly on the basis, before we dismiss these, uh, these uh, policy shifts, it's partly on the basis of these shifts that in 2018, the OECD DAX peer review Donor peer review gave Canada pretty high marks in this area and concluded that, and I quote, it integrates humanitarian assistance and support for peace and stability quite well in its response to crises. Okay, so let's look a little more at what that meant in practice. Next slide, please. So Walter already mentioned the deployment uh, of uh, troops to MINUSMA in Mali. Well, the following year, Canada became chair of the IDPS, which is the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building. This is the platform that when Canada chaired it way back in 2010, 2011, negotiated the West, basically Northern donors and multilaterals like the UN and the World Bank, negotiated the New Deal with 20 of the most fragile and conflict-affected states in the world. And that New Deal essentially Uh, laid out provisions for cooperating very differently, for putting France in lead of peace building and state building processes, and uh, and if you will, aligning international aligning international support on a range of priorities, from human security to access to justice to econ what they call the economic fundamentals like jobs and revenues and so on. Now, basically, after that, uh, under the, in the late Harper governments. Canada basically forgot about the New Deal. It wasn't the only one, but it did that. Well, last year, it took the co-chair of the, this IDPS platform again, and it basically, uh, uh, if you will, played a key role in putting the New Deal back on the international agenda, linked to uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peaceful societies, access to justice, and effective institutions through a statement called the IDPS Peace Vision. I recommend you look at it if you haven't, um, because again, it really signals this kind of policy shift that has taken place uh, in, the, in the past few years under the Trudeau government. This year, as we speak, Canada is more than halfway through its term as co-chair of the UN Peacebuilding Commission, uh, in which it's leading efforts to strengthen the PBC's preventative role and its collaboration with the IMF, Monetary Fund, and the World Bank to address the economic drivers of conflict. Again, this is not a new issue, 
But this is really quite new for Canada to make this a priority uh, and to basically you know, buy into the idea that economic policy, macroeconomic policy, sectoral policies, fiscal policies have to be in tune with peace uh, efforts. Otherwise, they'll undo peace efforts, as has happened in, in many countries. So these are, these are very, uh, very important policy shifts. Nonetheless, it's important to ask, well, how do these uh, shifts actually work out on the ground? My basic argument in the last part of my presentation is that Canada, not alone, but Canada, among other um, international uh, players in this area, is having enormous difficulty translating its policy shifts into better outcomes in fragile and conflict-affected states that are priorities for us, partly because of the political contradictions, and I use that word advisedly, uh, uh, of our engagement in those contexts. Let me illustrate that argument with three examples of countries that are very important to Canada. They're among Canada's priorities, um, and they've also been hosted or are currently hosting a major or a much smaller UN peace mission or ver verification mission. So the three examples are Colombia, um, Mali, and Haiti. Next slide. Now in, Ken Ken in, May in Mali, and my apologies to Mali experts, I'm going to uh, really give a very simplified version of very complex situations. We can unpack these in the Q's and A's. Uh, but my sense is that the big picture is that Canada is a longstanding uh, development partner uh, of uh, Mali and more recently security partner including through the deployment of troops' contribution to MINUSMA. Canada is currently spending about $140 million a year on humanitarian assistance and peace building, plus in areas like the implementation of the Algiers Peace Accord, uh, justice and reconciliation, security sector reform, um, uh, increasing promoting women's meaningful participation in peace building, and uh, also economic and social development for peace in that country. Those are all really important. But despite uh, those contributions and contributions by the UN and many other partners uh, in this area, <clears throat> and despite important advances like the elections in 2013 and uh, the Algiers Peace Accord itself, Mali has been unable to significantly reduce conflict dynamics in the North, it experienced another coup just last month, and women's peace roles have become marginal, or have remained quite marginal despite our important support. Let, so many factors, obviously, and again, I'm simplifying, but many factors converge to explain this gap between what Canada and other international partners are investing and what is actually the outcomes, what are actually the outcomes in Mali. And I follow a Malian political uh, analyst called uh, Berga Mashi, who's uh, published a lot in, on donor uh, government, donor state relations in Mali. She argues that Canada, the UN and Western partners end up supporting political, military and economic elites in Mali who are at best, fundamentally ambivalent about the more far-reaching provisions of the Algiers Peace Accord, and it's not a radical accord. Take a look at it if you're interested. Um, and more, more fundamentally, they're, they're ambivalent at best about anything resembling a transformative approach to peace building and development. And according to some Canadian critics, Canadian firms' involvement in Mali's uh, mining uh, sector makes us even more vulnerable to elite capture by those very same elites. Okay, next slide, please. Let's take a glance at dynamics in Colombia. So there are many promising uh, elements to, uh, Sarah, can you click forward, please? Thanks, and all the way. There's some animation stayed in there. Anyways, very many promising elements to Canada's approach. Uh, so it's, again, a whole-of-government approach, uh, broader than the Mali approach because it links uh, official development assistance to a, a lot of uh, foreign direct investment by Canadian firms, a, a free trade agreement, a foreign investment protection agreement, uh, and extensive cooperation in the areas of peace, security, and justice. Um, 
a quantitative leader. In dollar terms, it's a much smaller program because Colombia is a high middle income country. It has a lot of financial, human and other resources itself. So, but with $40 million a year, Canada supports, invests uh, significantly in a multi-donor post-conflict trust funds in uh, programs to support reintegration uh, of conflict-affected children and youth as well as uh, development in rural communities that have been affected by conflict and violence, line man action, transitional justice, and so on. And Canada also co-chairs the human rights and gender equality tables, sectoral tables, and basically donor government uh, coordination tables with the government of Colombia. So Canada's doing a lot of, and in many ways, it's sort of targeting the right sectors and the right uh, taking a, a, a very informed approach. Now, Global Affairs Canada says that the FTA and the FIPA agreement have increased trade and direct investment without compromising human rights. Take a look at GAC's reports and you can decide for yourself. On the other side, Canadian and Colombian civil society uh, organizations say that the FTA Canada's investment, particularly in mining oil and gas, and our extensive security cooperation including with military forces accused of grave human rights violations, that these other pieces of our cooperation actually undermine what the good we're doing in the areas of human rights and peace. Now that debate is long standing, but it's become really intense over the past two years, given the election of uh, President Duque and his government, and the, in practice, quite uneven support of that government for the 2016 peace accord um, and the resurgence of really very grave human rights violations against activists in the past few years. 500 activists ha had been killed by April, 70 activists have been killed according to even the government's figure in the past in the past six months. So this is very serious. Now here too, critics uh, you know, admit that there's many actors and factors at play here. Let's, and I want to simplify, but for the sake of this argument, for this, this discussion today, let me cite critics who argue that the Achilles heel of Canada's approach is that it relies too heavily on partnering with political, economic, and security elites whose actions, not their rhetoric, look at their actions, particularly under the current government, show that they're not fundamentally committed to peace, that it's transformative in any sense, so positive peace in Galtung's sense despite the 2016 Accord, which codifies extensively and in detail, uh, you know, numerous provisions for transformative peace. This government, the critics say, not backing it by basically not denouncing the government and playing ball with it. Canada is, is letting uh, in the good work it's, it's doing be undermined by some of those elites. Okay, next slide. Last case, Haiti. So here too, Canada uh, has a long-standing uh, development cooperation and indeed security uh, relationship with Haiti. It's the second largest donor still, even though our aid uh, has gone down to $75 million a year. It's still significant. It's a whole of government approach. Canada made large contributions to MINUSTA, particularly in the police, in the area of policing. So it's true, Walter's numbers are totally right, uh, but, uh, you know, Canada was deploying over 100 police in Minusta at one point. It was a very large contingent, very high level, very specialized, quite a significant. And although Walter said that there's no high level Canadian officers in UN missions, I'm sorry. We still have the command of the police contingent in Binu, which is a very small observer mission. It's an office. It's not a peace operation, but it's quite significant in that context. So, you know. Uh, it's, Canada still uh, plays plays uh, a role. It's still Canada is a member of the core group, and historically, it's been a co-lead of the gender equality table, which uh, played a key role in having, uh, under previous government, a national gender equality policy, quite a progressive and tra potentially transformative policy adopted. Okay, that's the good news. Now, the critics, though, <clears throat> argue that Ottawa is doing all that, but at the same time, it's supporting a corrupt and uh, unpopular governments. For example, it's propping up, it has been propping up the Moise government since 2017, even in the face from mid July 2018, 
18 onward, of massive. Now, I don't use that word lightly. These had, were massive protests, uh, really huge part of the population and many parts of even the elite, the church, the business community, basically protesting against very well documented, again, massive corruption uh, by uh, political and bureaucratic elites in, 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 in cahoots with the Haitian private sector. Uh, including the current president of, of Haiti, Mr. Mr. Moise. Now, this is not a bunch of radicals who are saying that he's corrupt. Well, they were saying that too. The large petro Caribe challenger movement was, was saying that very clearly, right? But one uh, major Senate commission and two major reports by the uh, very respected uh, 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 court of essentially administrative court in Haiti, one of the few uh, you know, rigorous institutions in the Haitian state, left in the Haitian state, have documented this corruption, including of the prime minister, of the president himself, in extensive detail. Now, even in the areas like uh, gender equality and police reform where there's progress, the critics say, peace building and development are being reversed as a result of our support, our acquiescence, if you will, to this government and their uh, minority supporters uh, um, policies. Okay, oh, by the way, this government also presided over the dissolution of parliament. Parliament was already dysfunctional, but they strategically let it run out of its mandate so they could govern by decree. So, our government, Canada, says we're supporting democracy and the constitutional order in Haiti. Well, that government is running, is ruling by the creep. So there's a lot of contradictions there, and that's what I, I really want to get across. Okay, let me end with my last slide because I think I'm running out of time. I'm not over already. What are the options? Okay, now, there's no silver bullet in any of these contexts uh, or more, more generally. And I'm very cautious about offering policy advice in countries that I don't know deeply. But, but I've been working in and on Haiti for over 15 years. I've been there 25 times. I've learned a few things in that process. It doesn't mean I'm an expert, but here is what I would say Canada could have done and may still do differently. <clears throat> Canada could have distanced itself from the Moise government in 2018 and after um, when massive protests, including you know, respected authorities like church authorities distanced themselves from that government, called for a dialogue, called for elections, Canada could have joined that, could have worked to persuade that government and other partners, the US and the UN, to engage with the Petro Challenger movement, other civil society organizations, incredible opposition parties, some of which exist in Haiti to lay the foundations for free and fair elections and governmental change this year. But we missed the boat. So we missed that window, not alone. Many actors missed that, that window of opportunity, but it isn't too late to support some of those civil society organizations, some uh, in the international community who are pushing right now as we speak for the creation of a credible Provisional Electoral Council, not the cronies that, prime, that President Moise has named to the, 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 the Electoral Council, who will likely, if they stand, uh, oversee a fraudulent election, which could be even more disastrous for the country. So if Canada actually pushed for the creation, Canada and its partners, Canada alone can't do much, but you know, with other members of the core group, so it could support Haitian organizations that are, that are lobbying actively serious in a very professional way for the formation of a credible electoral council which could lead to fair elections next year in 2021 and maybe a more legitimate government by 2022 that's too late for many people but that's probably the best possible uh, electoral calendar and, and outcome that we can hope for uh, but Canada would have to change its approach uh, from acquiescence to, uh, I would say, really vis more visionary advocacy for change. Now, Canada doesn't have to dictate terms. It shouldn't say, Haiti, you should do this. You're a failed state. You know, no, it's about supporting civil society organizations and movements, including the historic women's movement that is at the center of this movement. It's a pillar of that has been you know, really central to these demands since 2018 and, and in fact better. 
right? And so they're not only pushing for elections, they're pushing for a series of institutional reforms and, and other changes that would move better governance and more equitable development much higher up leading uh, political parties and other elites, elites political agendas. Okay, so this is just a snapshot and I'm offering this as an illustration, it's just an example of what that more politically astute and appropriate approach to governance, peace and development would look like, right? We all talk, oh, you know, politics matter, bring politics, what does it mean, right? So here's an illustration, I think, well, what that could mean and what Canada could do in one uh, co concrete context that's quite important, a priority for Canada, has been for a long time. Now, moving beyond this particular example, the common thread I would submit to uh, uh, that links these cases and Canada's approach in these cases is the importance of not letting ourselves be captured by self-serving elites, of not being afraid of engaging with social movements and parties that may speak a radical language we don't quite appreciate sometimes, but that actually represent broad-based aspirations for change that could be part of that change if we insisted that they be given a fair chance to live instead of being assassinated. I don't say that lightly. That's what's happening, even in Haiti, not to mention in Colombia or Mali right now with civil society activists who speak out on these issues, to live the right to life, to, to participate freely and fairly in elections, and maybe even to lead a government once in a while. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. A lot um, already in those first two presentations to take in, um, but um, now I'm going to turn it over to Peggy. And then after that, we'll open it up to uh, questions and discussions. Go ahead, Peggy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jane. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the four webinars thus far, two key themes have emerged. The primacy of politics, or what Jean-Marie Guéhenot described in his keynote presentation as the preeminent UN role in facilitating conflict resolution, and the need, and, and two, the other key theme, the need to rebuild or forge a new consensus around the fundamentals of UN peacekeeping based on the core principles of consent of the parties, impartiality, and limited use of force. Turning first to the primacy of politics, the 2015 High Level Independent Panel on Peace Operations known as HIPPO, for those of you wondering what that acronym meant, since it has been referenced a few times in our discussions uh, to date. That report defines politics in this phrase to mean in its most basic form, the search for negotiated solutions. As for the primacy of that activity, HIPPO goes on to say, the main effort of any peace operation must be to focus international attention leverage and resources on supporting national actors to restore peace, address underlying conflict drivers, and meet the legitimate interests of the wider population, not just a small elite. Certainly something that uh, Stephen Mirani has spoken a great deal of, about, the importance of that. Before going any further, let me underscore the words facilitating conflict resolution and supporting national actors in the two definitions I have just noted. It bears emphasizing and repeating that the primary responsibility for conflict resolution is on the parties themselves. And it is the role of the international community, including Canada, to facilitate them doing so in as co coherent and mutually reinforcing manner as possible. Let me again refer back to our keynote speaker and recall his discussion of the three circles involved in finding a comprehensive solution. The national level with the parties themselves, but reaching all the way down to the grassroots. The regional actors who may be directly involved or supporting one or the other of the parties and the global actors, the big powers, who again may be directly or indirectly involved. Hence the need for a process specifically designed to address these various types of actors and for dedicated diplomatic expertise to support it. 
Tori Holt added to this discussion in her remarks in panel three on Saturday, 3 October, where she referenced a very recent Stimson Center study, uh, which Jane, uh, which our moderator, Jane Bolden, also referenced, entitled The Political Practice of Peacekeeping. Quoting from that study, political primacy means placing the political solution at the center of the work of a peace operation and articulating how all other mission activities would contribute to that solution. In explaining this concept to NATO military commanders at a 2014 seminar where I was speaking on the value added of UN peacekeeping and less than subtly demonstrating its superiority for building the peace, as compared to military-led missions with no such political role, I use the terminology that the center of gravity of a UN peace operation is the peace process, which means in turn that the military and police, the security elements, while vital, are supporting elements in, our, in an overarching political effort. The Stimson Report goes further in defining political solution in a peace operations context as one where parties reach negotiated inclusive agreements to halt the killing and to attempt to address the major grievances that triggered the violent conflict or which could be likely to trigger further violent conflict. As such, a political solution off offers a comprehensive framework for a sustainable transition to peace and a clear set of commonly agreed guidelines for achieving it. Well, that's the goal anyway. And happily, that same Stimson uh, Center report suggests there are lots of ways a UN peacekeeping mission can still arrive at, dur at a durable political solution without the best case scenario of being able to deploy in the context of a comprehensive peace agreement or an agreed process to that end. Nevertheless, at a minimum, the mandate must be built around the core conflict resolution facilitation activity. But already when I gave that lecture to NATO commanders and February, military commanders in February 2014, the value added or the primacy of, of politics and UN peace operations was under greater and greater threat. The Stimson Center report echoes Ambassador Gehano and other panelists discussion of the increasing complexity of conflicts over the past decade with a tripling of major civil wars driven by the growing role of non-state actors, the greater impact of violent extremism, and the influence of transnational crime networks. This has led to UN peacekeepers increasingly being deployed, not only in the absence of a viable peace process, but in the midst of ongoing large-scale conflict. Substantially increasing the risk to peacekeepers and civilians alike and resulting in some cases, as previous speakers have mentioned in previous panels, in the protection of civilians and even the security of the mission itself becoming the highest mission priority, not the resolution of the conflict. I wish to turn now briefly to the other key theme that has emerged from our webinars, the need to begin to rebuild or to forge a new consensus around the fundamentals of UN peacekeeping based on the core principles of consent of the parties, impartiality, and limited use of force. All three principles are under a direct assault from so-called stabilization mandates from the UN Security Council, which call on the peacekeeping missions to support the government, including by military means, in reestablishing state authority. Jane Bolden talked about the threat to impartiality posed by such mandates from the perception of the opposing parties and, and indeed the population as well. While Tori Hunt in panel three reminded us that impartiality is not neutrality and use of force in defense of the mandate might require taking sides, I would argue that a mandate that puts impartiality at such grave risk is not a sustainable course. And this is particularly true when the government being supported in this way is itself guilty of human rights violations against its own citizens or other blatant instances of poor governance. Add to that dilemma what Ambassador Gehano has called in another context, the polluting of peace operations by counterterrorism operations, where the UN peacekeeping mission, as in the case of Mali, 
is deployed at the same time as two separate counterinsurgency missions, one led by France, the other by a group of neighboring countries, in respect of which the UN, is man the UN mission is called upon to coordinate and support those efforts. Not only does this make the UN mission a soft target for terrorists and undermine the perception of mission impartiality, but also, as Richard Gowan pointed out in panel one, counterinsurgency operations can significantly impede the UN's ability to reach out to extremists with national agendas that could otherwise be amenable to negotiation. And where a mission is almost completely focused on its stabilization and protection of civilian mandates, another pitfall awaits. To the extent that the peacekeepers succeed relatively well in these tasks, the government may then feel no pressure to make the compromises necessary to address governance shortfalls underpinning the conflict, leaving the UN trapped in the mission with no exit strategy in sight. Here, I wish to refer once again to the Stimson Report, which makes an exceedingly important point in my view for those like Canada that have put a priority on protection of civilians in their pre-deployment training of Canadian peacekeepers. The report emphasizes that the mandated task of the protection of civilians but not, must not be a separate objective, unconnected to the broader political solution, or as they put it, the political strategy must position the protection of civilians as a clear enabler for a political solution rather than a standalone activity. Okay, against that backdrop, wither Canada. This brings me to the role for Canada in helping address the twin challenges our webinars have highlighted in particular. Restoring the preeminence in Security Council mandates for UN peace operations of the UN role in facilitating a political solution to the conflict, that's number one, and rebuilding a consensus among troop contributing nations, Security Council members, and the broader international community around the three core peacekeeping principles of consent, impartiality, and limited use of force. The agenda we need to champion is clear. How might we do it? Well, let me start with the fundamental precondition. No matter how many good ideas Canada may have for advancing this agenda, if we want to have influence, we need to fully re-engage in UN peacekeeping. As our government promised way back in 2015, and as we've heard, reiterated at the 2017 Vancouver conference. And, and uh, both Tori Hunt and Walter Dorn have spoken to that directly. Full re-engagement means first and foremost, we need to put sufficient military and police boots on the ground. We've made some important promises in specific areas that Walter has mentioned uh, and Stephen, including not least, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the doctrine, development of doctrine in relation to child soldiers. But these are not a substitute for getting our military and police contributions up to par. And that will in turn put Canada in a better position to help overcome the mandate dilemmas I and past speakers have highlighted. <clears throat> Had we won a seat on the UN Security Council, we would of course been directly involved or perhaps not directly, but at least somewhat involved because uh, you know, one has to remember the role of the P5, but nonetheless, we would have been involved in helping fashion UN Security Council mandates for peacekeeping operations. But there is still much that we can do as a troop contributing nation and in a range of diplomatic settings, not only multilateral ones, but as Tori Holt reminded us in bilateral contexts as well. Our permanent representatives in New, York, in New York, our ambassadors on the ground in the conflict affected countries where peacekeeping operations are situate, our ambassadors in the capitals of the P5 countries, our ambassadors resident in key troop contributing nations, including of course those who are also on the Security Council as Norway and Ireland will be in 2021-22, all have a role to play in reinforcing support for the UN missions conflict resolution, facilitation role, and the core principles of UN peacekeeping. But our ambassadors need clear direction from our foreign minister that this is a priority for global affairs, the lead Canadian government department on UN peacekeeping. 
How many Canadians even know that it is global affairs, not national defense, that has the lead? Let me also say a word about coordination. Paul Williams in panel two talked about the plethora of actors on the ground with which the UN mission must deal. This is not a new phenomenon, but what is new is the erosion of consensus on the vital co coordination that the UN can and must play in theater. And that in turn means that troop contributing nations like Canada, who are also potentially contributing humanitarian or development funds and other forms of assistance, must champion that coordination role and support, not undermine it, to garner attention or play into a domestic agenda. It's like the role of a mediator. His or her success is measured in the ownership over the deal that he or she instills in the parties, and that means quiet diplomacy. And now, as I'm nearing the close of my comments, a word about UNEPS, the United Nations Emergency Peace Service, outlined by Peter Longiel in panel three. It is a vital step towards timely deployment of well-equipped and well-resourced military and civilian peacekeepers in the UN peacekeeping startup phase and a Canadian idea that deserves to be championed by Canada once again, especially given its conflict prevention and deterrence potential. But it will not be a substitute for addressing the current schisms among troop contributors and Security Council members on the fundamental role and promise of UN peacekeeping as a key enabler in the long overdue shift to a more cooperative security environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you to all three. And were we all present in a room, I'm sure there'd be lots of applause at this moment. <laughs> so we can just pretend that's what's happening because I'm, I'm sure that's the case. So um, I'm just going to make a couple of quick comments myself um, in order to give any, we've got a few questions um, open already. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of comments to give anybody else a chance to get their thoughts together for a second. Um, I'm really struck by the um, by listening to the three panelists, the extent to which the dilemmas and um, um, contradictions and issues associated that we can identify with policy around peacekeeping and the peace agenda broadly at the international level mirror get mirrored at the at the domestic level. Um, you know, pe peacekeeping can be a political uh, football, both internationally and, and domestically. Um, and all three, I think, reminded us that the peacekeeping aspect of the equation is really only one piece, um, and I think everybody really emphasized this, of the broader um, uh, conflict resolution and peace agenda. Um, in various ways, all of the panelists um, addressed that. If we, uh, one of the things that I would pull out of what everybody said is that the, there's a real risk, again, both domestically and internationally, both levels here, um, at focusing on peacekeeping as, um, or even a phase in peace operations as the end point. Um, and we do tend to have that yeah, fixate, I mean, I'm using we broadly, but we do tend to fall into that trap. Um, and finally, everybody had a plea for Canada to do more. And on that, I would say, even though we've been tracking peacekeeping and Walter's slide really demonstrated the dip um, in peacekeeping contributions and the not expected rise, um, I would say that it's not just about peacekeeping, that under the Harper years, we really pulled back from the UN and as a whole. And peacekeeping was only one part of that. And that's what really has to, I think everybody was trying to was saying it in different ways, but that's one thing that has to really come back is a broad commitment, not just on peacekeeping, but to the UN as the central player in a uh, in the pursuit of international peace and security. So I'm going to stop being on a soapbox there, but you guys got me going. Okay, so um, let's um, open it up to questions. I know there was also one sent by email. Um, so there's, um, what I'd say we have 17, can we go over a bit, Peggy? Yeah, I think we can. Yes. yes. Okay. Let's say we have roughly 20, 25 minutes left, depending on how it goes. Um, 
I think that um, um, Peter had a specific point, Peter Langille had a specific point for Walter. I don't know whether you saw that, Walter, and you might want to pick that up. Um, and then I thought um, somebody has put in a question for um, Peggy, but I would be interested in Walter's response too on the um, question about the um, Canada's contribution to peacekeeping and the size and capacity of Canada's diplomatic mission in the same host country. I don't know whether I'm putting you on the spot there, Walter, but I thought that was kind of you as well. Um, so I'm going to start with Walter to respond to those points. And then there's a couple of questions there for Stephen. And we'll go next to Stephen and then um, uh, come to Peggy. And any, I'm trying to pull questions together and I'm relying on Sarah to clear the slate as we do that. Yep, Peggy, do you want to? I just wanted to indicate that I, I would like to get in on Robin Collins' question about stabilization. Okay, so would I actually. Feel free to go ahead, Peggy. I'll, I'll follow up on that too. Okay. No, Walter, you go first. So okay, we're not so following the order of the questions then, okay. Okay, so on Robin like Collins and stabilization, um, I view stabilization as being a superficial form of peacekeeping. If you're just there to stabilize the situation, you don't deal with the, low, the root causes, you don't deal with the tensions in society, you might stabilize a country or a region under a dictator and then say, okay, check mark is stabilized. There's no more mass killings going on, but there might be political repression and lots of other factors. Whereas uh, peace operations deal with deeper, it's the positive peace as well as the negative peace, that is uh, the absence of, of actual fighting. So um, I, I think stabilization is, is really uh, is an important concept, but that it should be just viewed as one step towards a broader peace process. And I really endorse Peggy's uh, centrality of the peace process. Uh, I think that sometimes it actually is the military has a key role in advancing the peace process more than the politicians, because they can actually show force and show movement on the ground it can cause the, the actors to change their positions radically, even if the negotiator is very poor. Uh, at the same time, the, um, the peace process is led by the, by the civilians, by the, usually the SRSG, Special Representative Secretary General. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to distinguish this, like Peggy said, the coin operations, that's counterinsurgency operations, from the UN operations. And if you have too much overlap between the two, then the UN operations become a soft underbelly that can be the retaliation, the hostage taking, and that can come there. So we do have to keep this distance. And I have been uneasy about the close links between Operation Barkhan, the French letter operation, and uh, the operation of the, uh, the G4 in, or G5 in, in Mali, that they had, um, they were using uh, too much. Uh, force and too, too uh, close a relationship to the UN, um, that the UN could be suffering because of that. There should be, I, I believe in a good cop, bad cop approach, but you have to make sure that, that these roles are sufficiently uh, separated, that one doesn't get punished for the actions of the other. Great. Uh, Do you want to pick up on Peter's point at all, Walter? Or uh, just Numbers. Can I just jump in on the stabilization because there's, there's a whole other aspect uh, to it, if I might, before we get into the other issue. Okay, I was going to come back to that, but go ahead. Um, oh, sorry, Jane. Uh, but um, it, it, the stabilization that I was talking about and that Jane has been talking about is a very specific mandate given to the UN mission to help, including militarily, the government reassert authority. And in the bluntest terms, that means a mandate to fight with the government in retaking territory, which actually took place. That was done in the DRC. And my uh, argument is that is that that is not a that we don't have to worry about somebody else doing it. That should not be done. What the UN should be doing is negotiating the government's retaking of control and reassertion of control over territory. Now, of course, we have to admit, we have to face the fact that there may be elements, and that's where this terrorist aspect comes in. Richard Gallen talked about, um, about uh, trans actors with transnational agendas. 
that weren't really interested in, in, in negotiating uh, a resolution of the conflict. They were, you know, they were taking advantage of that conflict to pursue broader aims. And so that would be the role of the, of the, of the, of the counterinsurgency force, a completely separate force. Um, so the answer is no one else, no one would take on this very peculiar stabilization role that's been given to the UN, which I think is an impossible and inappropriate one um, for the UN to take on. And I just want to echo uh, many of the comments that Walter made about you know, concerns about the co-location of the of the of these other missions. Um, I think that the problems would be lessened somewhat by the UN mission not having this direct requirement to coordinate and support the counterinsurgency mission. I think that is very problematic from an impartiality standpoint. But I also would go back to UNEPs again, and that is. Uh, if it, a, a, a really capable uh, UN force wouldn't be such a soft target. So none of these answers are perfect. This whole thing is an imperfect enterprise, but I hope that gets at some of those uh, issues. And of course, uh, Jane, you have another viewpoint with respect to how, um, how that mandate um, uh, might be handled. Yeah, so I will just say really briefly, because I don't want to divert too much here, that my argument was that um, stabilization should be framed outside of the uh, impartiality rubric, and that we should be focusing on stabilization of the state and not the government of the day. Just leave it at that for the moment. Um, um, and so, that, from my perspective, leaves open the possibility that the UN does it, which I think was the gist of that question. Okay, so um, let's turn, sorry, the questions come up uh, on my end in, in uh, out of chronological order, that's my problem. So um, what I want to do is to turn to the question from an anonymous attendee, um, which um, is to Peggy. What are your thoughts on Canada's contributions to peacekeeping and the size slash capacity of Canada's diplomatic mission in the same host country? Okay, I'm trying to find that question. Now. Yeah, I know it's um, disappeared so it's somewhere. It's 805. Yeah. 805 is the time on it. Uh, okay, I can't. I it's disappeared completely from my from my screen. But anyway, um, I mean, uh, oh yes, here I found it. Um, what are your thoughts on Canada's contribution? I mean, on the first part of the answer, I mean, I, I've tried to make it clear. Essentially, you know, I support what Walter is saying about what what Canada has to do with respect to, you know, to contributing, fully contributing to peacekeeping operations. I'm, I like all these, you know, these very specific niche areas that Canada has 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 articulated. Um, but but you know, we have to do much more across the board. Um, and uh, we have to align, I mean, I didn't get into some of the areas of uh, support to the peace process, uh, to support to an inclusive peace process, and, um, you know, other aspects of the, uh, of the work that the UN is doing, um, because I, I wanted to focus my attention on the real priority that Canada can bring, that Canada's, uh, if, we, if we fully re-engage, then we can help we, we should we can focus our attention on some of these real dilemmas that are really causing problems for um, for UN peacekeeping. But um, that but the second part of the question, the size of, of Canada's diplomatic mission in the same host country. I mean, I think that's a very good question. And I think, yes, if we're if we're uh, making uh, peacekeeping a priority, if we are reengaging, if we have forces on the ground, if we're putting money, a significant monies into it, then our mission, our diplomatic mission in that host country should be equipped to support, should be equipped to support all of those activities. And first and foremost, should be, um, should operate um, as part of what's often been called friends of the mission and uh, supporting the mission, relaying back to, troop, to the capital, uh, specific needs that might need to be met, relaying back information that could then play into Security Council discussions I mean, there's a really important role that the diplomatic mission on the ground can play. Um, uh, and and 
and, and so I, 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 I thank uh, the anonymous attendee very much for that very, very helpful question. Okay, great. So thank you. And um, I'm going to turn to Stephen now and ask him, there's two questions in a row there, Stephen. I don't know whether they show up in the same way at your end, one anonymous and one from Roy Culpepper. Um, and you're muted. <laughs> so the reminder, and thank you for the question. So let me uh, start with Roy's and then broaden that out to whole of government approaches. So um, like Roy and several other um, People commented in the chat. It's it's encouraging that the Canadian government is, uh, you know, in addition to its work on you know, trying to re-engage with peace operations, as limited as that re-engagement has been, and other pieces. Um, the uh, it's coming out in favor of harmonizing uh, economic and social policies with. Uh, peace building and uh, our international approaches on, on peace operations per se is, is actually really important. Um, th this issue, set of issues went, you know, almost largely ignored in the whole post 9-11 period because of other priorities, right? But, you know, in the late 1990s, a lot of progress had been made on this, um, you know, following uh, Alvaro de Soto, who was Undersecretary General and the mediator of the Salvadoran peace agreements, and then who threw up his hand when he saw that while he was helping the government and the guerrillas mediate, uh, uh, negotiate peace agreements and major reforms and investments under those peace agreements, the gov same conservative government of El Salvador was negotiating with the IMF and the World Bank on a you know orthodox structural adjustment program that was you know completely. Uh, market oriented and, and basically aimed to strip back the state's role in the economy, including its capacity to raise revenues and uh, and to invest those revenues then in rural development, uh, in resettling refugees and internally displaced persons and ex-combatants in reforming the police and so on. So, um, in the late 1990s, uh, there was a lot of steps towards trying to actually make that harmonization work in neighboring Guatemala, where the peace accords reflected that attempt, and even the IMF and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank signed on to that approach, right? But it basically, 9-11 and you know, uh, a lot of other events uh, in the early 2000s uh, really uh, threw that off, I would say, uh, and put other priorities on international agendas. Um, then the New Deal, one of the reasons why the New Deal is important <clears throat> signed in 2011, is it brought those things back and said, look, yeah, of course, reforming a police force is important. And of course, a peace operation is important. And of course, access to justice is important. But so are economic fundamentals. Without massive, you know, a boost in employment, particularly for youth who you know, are coming out of insurgent groups or, and so on, uh, or who might go into them, uh, without uh, a boost in government revenues and its capacity to invest strategically in rural development, in health and education, uh, and so on, in justice uh, for all, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be back at square one, and the UN is going to be reinvited because the conflict is going to 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 come back. This has happened in places like South Sudan, right? <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, What's really interesting in, in the Canadian case is uh, that, you know, despite the fact that Canada actually co-chaired the platform that negotiated the New Deal, again, that got forgotten, that got lost. Toby Nussbaum, you know, was so disillusioned. He was the co he was a senior CETA official who co-chaired the IDPS. And he moved to the National Capital uh, Commission, where he's leading right now. And right, well, well that, that energy and that knowledge could have been maintained in government, but the Harper years destroyed a lot of institution and forced a lot of out migration from some of our, our best and our brightest. Um, but okay, so in 2019, better late than never, eight years later, the Canadian government, this Canadian government, let's be clear, uh, recognized this as, as an issue. Now, how far is it willing to go? And this is to Roy's, the central part of Roy's question, which was, uh, doesn't it require, wouldn't it require, wouldn't real policy harmonization for peace, for conflict resolution, 
to feed the political solution and its implementation as, as Peggy reminded. Wouldn't that require moving beyond liberal, neoliberal policies, right? My answer is it would require that not just at the policy level, but at the level of practice. And I'm not sure that even the current Canadian government, despite its well-meaning statements about equity and inclusion and growth for everyone and so on, really gets that. You know, it's like there's a dilemma in their tensions between classical uh, UN principles and stabilization missions, not to mention counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. There's real tensions, if not contradictions, between uh, you know market-oriented approaches and protecting Canadian Canada's you know, foreign investments in oil and gas and mining uh, in Colombia and in Mali and and so on. Uh, versus redistributive measures. The redistributive measures, which would have to begin with increased taxation revenues, foreign companies, including Canadian companies, paying their fair share, right? right? Uh, so that these governments have the revenues needed to actually invest them in building peace and implementing you know, the different dimensions of a political solution, even when it's been codified as, as it has in Colombia in the 2016 Peace Accords, right? So I don't think either Canada or the World Bank in its latest strategy on fragility and conflict and violence, the rhetoric is great. Just like in the UN pathways, the rhetoric is great, it's brilliant, but that's not what they're doing when push comes to shove. That's not really what they're funding and pushing for in Haiti, Colombia, and Mali, and so on. It's my impression. There's a lot more research that needs to be done on that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so let me just end on whole of government. So <clears throat> uh, last pitch. Uh, again, you know, as I tried to illustrate my examples from Colombia, Haiti, Mali, Canada is taking a whole of government approach in these places and in Afghanistan, but it doesn't mean that the balance of emphasis is right, is right for a primacy of politics approach. That's the point, right? It may be right to try to crush the Taliban. It may be right to try to keep President Moise in power, but it's not right from the point of view of trying to nurture a sustainable political solution to conflicts and other forms of violence and so on, right? Uh, and uh, so again, uh, I think that whole of government, you know, like comprehensive approaches and institutions and so on, sometimes tends to, it does us a disservice by masking the kind of really tough decisions that we need to take as a foreign investor and a foreign government uh, in order to really walk the talk or help uh, governments and other stakeholders and social movements in these countries actually, you know, build the kind of peace that they aspire to. Not sure we're there yet. I think we need a bigger, much bigger push in order to get there. Great. Thank you, um, Stephen. And I know Walter had his hand up, saying, so I think he's going to follow up on that. And if there, we have two comments from Peter Langeau. I know that Peggy's going to respond at least to one of them. But Walter, if you wanted to take any aspects of those as well before um, we sure. turn. You, you asked me to take a deal. Yeah, and then sure. the last question we have is from Earl Turcott, and we'll turn to that after that point. I can do that too. Uh, so Peter is really good on following Canadian history and peacekeeping, and he's correct that we had uh, over 5,000 troops rotating in 2000, 1993. However, the peak uh, any of any month, when we the number of troops that we had in any month was in July of 93, and that's where you get the 3,300 from. So it's not, even though the rotations are usually six months or eight months or sometimes a year, um, the, the peak at any one time, the number of Canadian peacekeepers we had in the field was 3,300 in, in uh, the middle of 1993. Um, so that's just the way you're doing counting, which is important to clarify. Uh, Earl's point about uh, Trump uh, putting some of our plans on hold uh, yes, because uh, we were doing the NAFTA renegotiation, there was a lot of hesitancy. And in fact, at one point, we were going to have the force commander in Mali be appointed um, by the UN. And the UN Under Secretary General actually held off two months for appointing, uh, appointing a force commander because he was waiting for Canada to come up with uh, someone saying that Canada wanted to have that position. Um, it, it, the, when Freeland first came in, there was some checks, you know, what does Washington think? about this idea of our leading in Mali and our going strong on peacekeeping. And Washington, in those early days of the Trump administration, was, was, was uh, not negative. They were like, go ahead, you know, that's, uh, 
Security Council mandates these missions, and we would like to see them succeed. So it was not really um, Washington that was holding things up. It wasn't Trump. It was rather Canada's fear that there might be some 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 uh, reticence from the United States, and that we wouldn't get whatever brownie points we thought were necessary to help us with the negotiation of, of NAFTA. So um, I, I think that we missed an opportunity there to lead in Mali. Um, and I know our chief of defense staff agrees with that, that position, and I think we can we could uh, have made a much bigger impact. And we, we did provide those nine. Oh, let's just give it a second. Sometimes it kicks back in. No, no, okay. Not oh, even lucky. Okay, so Peggy, why don't you pick up? Were you going to respond? Oh, he's back. You've just um, freeze there for a second. Obviously, I missed the last bit. Yeah, so I'll do. I'll um, I'll say primacy of politics. Uh, we need to get more Canadians in as SRSGs, the, the the primary leaders on the political side. You know, there are there are Canadians who have become SRSGs, but it's because they've climbed through the ranks of the UN Civil Service, the International Civil Service. Uh, we, we, what we really need to do is is uh, have prominent individuals like Roy Axworthy and Joe Clark and, and others who have taken on the heads of, uh, of the political dimensions of, of missions and, and served as mediators. We, we really are missing that and it's something we, we, we could very easily do. We could, we could uh, be on par with Norway in terms of influencing peace negotiations. But again, we're MIA. Okay, thanks. I totally agree with that last point. Peggy, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I guess my my wrinkle on the point about the um, SRSGs would be the same as the other comments I've made that uh, I, I think we'll have a far better chance of, of putting people forward for all these positions if we put our money where our mouth is in, in terms of support for, for peace operations. And, um, um, and I, you know, there's a long, we can have a long debate about what the reasons were for Canada. Um, and, and, and Walter and I have had the debate about uh, just how committed the Chief of Defence Staff really was. I don't buy the fact that if our Chief of Defence Staff wanted it to happen, that he couldn't equip uh, our, our uh, Minister of Defence with, um, with the tools to make the arguments at Cabinet. But I think there is there was a problem, and everybody's talked about it. There was a real problem with the foreign minister being so she was really a Canada US trade minister. And so she wasn't clearly making this a priority at the cabinet table and and and, and possibly was doing what Walter was suggesting that in fact she was urging caution because you know the priority had to be had to be Canada US trade. Um, so uh, but that leads to uh, the other question, by, I'm so glad that um, Peter Langille asked it because it's a point I should have made. He said, "Won't it? Wouldn't it help uh, with uh, generally with respect to UNEPS, but also more generally with respect to Canada's role in peacekeeping, for having U the UN peace operations as a clear def defense priority rather than as an uh, ancillary task?" and I, I, I made that pitch back in 2014 when I was asked to speak, go into the lion's den and speak to the Canadian Defence Association uh, Institute uh, annual conference. They were horrified at the thought that <laughs> this would become a defence priority. But then when the government made it, you know, made their promises, we, we, ha we held, you know, we garnered some hope that that would happen. So I, I think that, yes, that would be a logical, that would be a logical step along with um, global affairs taking up its rightful, its rightful role um, in, in, in supporting um, the defense minister at the cabinet table, not least when, when the media is hyping risks, risks to personnel in uh, particular operations. They did that with respect to Mali, even though the record uh, for Mali with respect to well-qualified, professional, Western, well-equipped Western peacekeeping forces was, uh, was uh, nil in terms of deaths. The only deaths of Western uh, peacekeepers has been due to accident. Um, and so, but nonetheless, when the media is hyping the risk, Canadians are concerned, then it really helps to have a strong 
of have strong voices around the cabinet table led by global affairs as to why this is in Canada's interest to do this, uh, to, to take the, to take what, to put the risk in context, but why, if there is any risk, why Canada should be taking that risk. I think those are my, my questions. Yeah, I think we're, and I think we're good on the questions as a whole. Um, and eight minutes over, so not too bad. So it's um, for me now to thank everybody, to thank the panel um, for a very active, uh, full um, set of presentations and um, as well for the questioners. Um, such good questions, right? And a, and a strong group who hung in throughout well past the time. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Peggy for asking me to do this and for organizing the whole thing over the past couple of weeks, really uh, um, so important an issue. And uh, so thank you for that. Do you want to say anything last, Peggy? I guess just to remind again, as you did at the beginning, that we're going to have a bit of a pause. We've got Thanksgiving weekend coming up and, um, and we, we want to, uh, to uh, really look and review and reflect to the planning committee on uh, on all that we've heard. And in that regard, I really would urge people, send in your comments. I mean, you've shown from your questions uh, the interest that you have. So please send in your comments to us because now we're going to, we're going to be preparing for that final panel uh, on conclusions and recommendations. The date, uh, it's still to be determined. Keep watching the Group of 78 um, webpage and, uh, and other ways that we will notify you once that's been determined. But in the meantime, help us with, uh, with your thoughts on, uh, on conclusions and recommendations. And in, in particular, of course, you know, Canada's role in, uh, in addressing uh, these very real uh, dilemmas that UN peacekeeping is facing so that we can ensure that it, it's, it's resilient and it's able to, uh, you know, to, to continue to live up to the, um, the, the, the promise that it, that it has shown thus far. So I'll stop there. Thank you all very much. Okay, thanks again. And a final reminder, you can rewatch everything if you need to in order to get more ideas and suggestions. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for all your help this evening. And uh, good luck with the conclusions. Bye for now. <laughs>